you probably know that uh, I am very, very big on uh, following social media. I have for a while. And um, uh, maybe under this time of our, of our stay in place orders, I spend a little too much time on it. I have to sort of watch it, you know. But it's a great way of keeping track of, you know, what people are thinking and doing and, and uh, you know, how to respond to trends and so on. So, uh, so there I am. And there's one word that's come up several years ago that you see when people are upset about something and they want to insult a whole other group of people who do not feel the way they feel or think the way they think. And that is the term sheeple. You may have heard that. You guys who are invisible, have you heard that word, right? Sheeple, right? We could have had that part of our pre-mass conversation. You know, who, are, who are the sheeple? And uh, sheeple are people who act like sheep. Namely, uh, sheep are dumb, and, uh, and they need somebody to tell them what to do. And so if you are doing what you're doing just because somebody told you to do it, instead of thinking on your own like an independent free thinker, well, then that makes you a sheeple. And so if somebody disagrees with you because you are kind of following what others are about, well, then you must not be a free thinking person. You must be one of these awful sheeple. Well, if I'm a sheeple, at least I have a good shepherd. Following Jesus is to lend my, my voice to one who knows me. Following Jesus is to trust that the one I'm following knows my heart, knows my thoughts, knows my life. A sheep doesn't follow just anybody. To be a sheep is not dumb. After all, the gospel says here, the sheep recognize, recognizes uh, the voice of strangers from the voice of the shepherd. That's a bunch of smart animals to me. So to be in a flock of sheep and following one's shepherd is not dumb at all. The question is, which shepherd are we going to follow? Which voice do we want to hear? Which voice do we want to recognize and say, ah, that one, that's my voice. I'm with that one. Several years ago at another parish, there was a woman and her husband who joined the parish after searching around for different churches they wanted to join. And they, they visited for a while and decided to join our church because she felt the people were very friendly and accepting. And she wore a surgical mask all the time. Uh, her, her name is Nancy. Uh, Nancy, and she was married to a man named Michael. They were very, very fine people. They're both deceased now. But Nancy wore this mask. And uh, after about two months of coming to, to week, weekly or weekday mass, they decided to join. And I said, why, of our, you know, why are you joining our parish? Happy to have you. Uh, she said, because this is the first place that I ever came to where nobody asked me, why do you have that mask on? The first place I ever came to her, nobody said, well, better we'll stay away from her. She's got a mask. Who knows what she's got? And so because everybody was just so normally accepting us, we said, this is the place where we're going to make our church home. And they became very active parishioners and very generous with their time and their resources. I remember the very first time she took off her mask. And it was like seeing the full Nancy for the first time. She had such a beautiful, radiant smile. All the women said, Nancy, you're so pretty. And you have such a beautiful smile. It's just so nice to see you. But you see, the reason why she wore the mask was because she was one of the first people in the area ever to have a heart-lung transplant. That's a very serious a surgery. Both, her, both lungs and her heart together is one intact sort of unit. Where sort of is very tough. You know, Cleveland is a very famous city for medical work. And so she had one of these. And she said, I'm not sick. I'm just worried that one of you or somebody somewhere else might be sick and not even know it. And then I would catch it. And if I catch it, it will kill me. So I wear this mask so that nobody has to worry about whether they might accidentally hurt me. Isn't that a wonderful approach, right? Not I'm wearing this mask because I'm afraid of you. But I'm worried that I might catch something and then somebody will say, maybe it was me that gave it to Nancy. I went to a local business recently. I won't say which business, what locality, and how recent, but it was to pick up a few things that 
were, were really necessary, one of those in and out kind of things I was going to do. And I had a mask on because I'm in the public and, and I'm going to be out there. So I put this mask on and I went there and not a single person had a mask on in this whole very busy place. I was telling you guys about it before mass. Not a single person, not even the workers had a mask on. And I saw one of the workers as they were you know, heading back into the store after helping a customer without a mask on, wiping their nose with their hand and grabbing the bar of the cart and heading into the store. I know it's gross to talk about this in church, but you see, this is why these things are important. This isn't a matter of Nancy with her genuine health condition trying to protect us from thinking that maybe we hurt her. Right? This is about a kind of sacrifice we need to make for one another. I'm, I guess I'd be pretty certain that this person who wipe themselves and grab the bar of the cart is healthy. I hope they're healthy, I imagine, so I, I pray that they're not sick. But I'm telling you, I am not going to that store again. I'm not going to do it. The governor, Holcomb or not, open it or close it, I'm not going there. Because that's how they're going to treat the sensitivities of people like me who want to stay healthy and not worry about infecting other people. This is a suffering. This is a, this is a difficulty. Not nearly the level of suffering that my good friend Nancy had to go through. Not nearly at that level. It's an inconvenience for me. It was life and death for her. It's an option for me. It was a necessity for her. She suffered. I am choosing something. St. Paul, I mean St. Peter, in the, in the letter, first letter of St. Peter we heard from today, talks about suffering. The very first line of this, the title of this homily, it would be this. Be patient when you suffer for doing what is good. We suffer for doing what is good. If you're suffering for the sake of your own self, that's not redemptive suffering. Suffering for the sake of your own self is self-improvement. It's sacrifice, to be sure. You know, for yourself, you, 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 you work hard, you're an athlete, and so you work, you lift weights, you run, you watch your diet. It, it's hard to do that, but you're doing that to improve yourself. It's laudable, but it's not the kind of redemptive suffering that we're talking about here. The redemptive suffering is the pattern of Christ who suffered for others. We suffer for one another. I wear this mask because in the off chance that I might be sick, I don't want to get you sick. That's why I do that. And if you're not willing to do that for me, that's your choice, but I honor your choice of not respecting me by staying away from you. This is what the social contract is. And, and the social contract is not just something that started with with the Enlightenment philosophers or the U.S. Constitution is deeply rooted in the gospel. Christ gave us the pattern. He suffered for us and by that redeemed us. We are suffering, and it's hard. We hear that in common voices out in public. People are tired of it. They want to end it. I understand it. But my suffering and your suffering, to be honest, is not anything like the suffering of people who get afflicted by this disease. Nothing like it. Don't even think that it comes close. Uh, my suffering and your suffering isn't anything like the suffering of medical care workers who stay away from their families for six weeks. Now, mothers who have not hugged their children for a month and a half because they don't want to get them sick, but they're still going to go to work to take care of the people who are sick. That is suffering. That is redemptive suffering because they're doing it for others. And if your suffering is, well, you just need a haircut and look at this mouth. <laughs> Yeah, if, that's, if this is the suffering I have, i got to look at this hair in the morning and think, holy cow, I need a haircut. This suffering? That's suffering? We have people in our parish who are emergency room nurses. People that sit in these pews when we can open the doors, they are suffering. I know personally, we know here, I'm not going to say who it is, but we know here, somebody in our pew, whose husband passed away from the coronavirus. She also tested positive. He had a frail health condition. And she's wondering if she killed her husband because she's alive and he's not. Live with that. That is suffering. I can't get my nails done. That's not suffering. I can't go to a bar tonight. That's not suffering. Live with the thought that you might have killed your spouse accidentally. That is suffering. And what makes our sacrifices now redemptive is because, as St. Peter says, 
If you are patient when you suffer for doing what is good, this is a grace before God. You see, dear friends, these, these sacrifices that we're called to make, whether you live in Illinois or Indiana or Texas or California, it doesn't matter. We're all call, being called to make a sacrifice. This is what St. Peter is talking about, right? And he says this is a grace. It's a grace. It's a gift. The word grace means gift. It doesn't feel like a gift, really. But it's a gift. Because he says, for to this you have been called. We have been called to this. We have been prepared for this moment. This moment of grace. This moment of sacrifice. This is what God has given for us because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. My friends, is this a blueprint for what we ought to be doing now? For to this you have been called. We have been called to this moment to demonstrate the difference between grace and self-centeredness. To show the difference between sacrificing for the good of others or just putting up with something for the sake of myself. In other words, we're being called in this moment to decide what kind of sheep we want to be. Whose voice are we going to hear? Whose voice do we want to follow? Which is the voice of the many voices out there? Which is the voice that we want to say, that's the one I know, and that's the one I'm going to follow. If it's Christ, if it's the voice of Christ that you want to say, yes, that's the one I want to follow, then he gave us an example of that. So on this fourth Sunday of Easter, when we celebrate Good Shepherd Sunday, rejoice in being a sheeple, one of Christ's sheeple. I know his voice. You know his voice. Together, let's follow it.